Cool. So, hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to the Finos Open Source and FinTech Meetup. I'm your host, Grizz Griswold, Marketing Manager for Finos. Uh, this is part of a series of meetups and podcasts that we produce and co-produce with partners in the United States, as well as the UK and APAC regions. Um, these meetups and podcasts focus on Finos projects, open source readiness, and thought leadership in open source in financial services and fintech. And today we're pleased to have Andrew Stein, Executive Director at JP Morgan Chase and lead of the Finos Perspective Project. And here's a little bit about Andrew. Andrew has been a web developer for 15 years, despite winning the 2018, I'm just gonna mess it up, the Nuesques? Nuesque. Sure. Nuesque Bacon Knight Award as a member of the team Lard and in Charge at Hogs for a Cause Barbecue Festival. Andrew rejected a life of perennial barbecue fame and returned to programming full-time where he currently works at On Perspective at J.P. Morgan Chase. And I'll let Andrew uh, describe the Perspective project, but today Andrew's going to be speaking on how to build an order book simulation with Perspective, and he'll be demoing that for you. Um, as far as Q&A and questions, uh, Please send those through the Q&A or raise your hand. We'll be asking Andrew those questions at the end. Uh, we will also be giving away t-shirts uh, at the end too. So please make sure that you stay. And I believe uh, this, <laughs> uh, this meetup is being recorded, um, but uh, all that should be on here is uh, Andrew and then um, we will make sure that uh, nobody else really shows up on the recording. Um, and if you have any other questions for us, again, ask in the Q and A. And with that, Andrew, the virtual floor is yours. All right, screen share here. Hey, everybody, can everybody see that? Oh, I'm not going to hear an answer. I'll assume everybody can see that. Uh, my name yeah. is Andrew. I'm a uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Andrew. I'm a developer at JP Morgan, and I work on uh, Perspective. If you're not familiar with Perspective, you can see it on your screen right now. Uh, Perspective is a uh, a project that we've been working on um, for quite a while, actually, uh, predating uh, open source, actually. So I don't, um, we give a lot of tech talks on perspective and we talk about a lot in, you know, uh, technology context and to other technologists, but we don't always get a chance to talk to it to, a, uh, to the Finos audience. So I wanted to take uh, a couple minutes right up top to uh, give you a little bit more of an introduction about where perspective came from and why it's relevant to open source. Um, perspective was originally a C++ um, data engine that we used internally at JP Morgan to power many of our real-time uh, risk and trading systems for desktop applications uh, at JP Morgan. And a couple of years ago, um, we had the opportunity to take this engine that had only been designed with desktop systems in mind and repurpose it for a new generation and a new type of uh, applications, specifically uh, web applications. Uh, we ported it to WebAssembly and we made a new front end for it and we uh, open sourced it and with partnership through Finos, uh, have been developing it uh, as an open source project ever since. Um, and I want to specifically just talk a little bit about um, the impact of open source and why this was, you know, relevant specifically to perspective. Um, you know, I know a lot of the people on this call are either working in the finance industry or working, you know, periphery to finance industry or in the financial technology industry. And, you know, I don't think I'm spinning any tails if I were to say that um, open source is still kind of a little bit of a taboo in the financial world. Um, you know, uh, financial technology and financial technologists have been involved in uh, software and technology since before Google was, you know, a gleam in Sergey Brin's eye, right? And I think because of that kind of long history with technology, um, the familiarity with kind of like taking all of your proprietary code and your uh, your market uh, uh, advantage and giving it away um, is something that I think people have always been kind of apprehensive of. Um, our experience with perspective and open sourcing in specific was absolutely not what I was expecting. It was the exact opposite of that. Um, the ability for us or the, the exposure that we got and the ability for us to actually kind of like focus on compatibility, um, stability, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
being able to be flexible and being able to use uh, the technology and use cases that we hadn't thought of. These are the kind of opportunities that would not have come up as a proprietary technology. And they really took this engine, the C++ engine, we've been using internally for years um, that would have otherwise died with all of the desktop UIs that we no longer use and that have been replaced with web UIs over the last decade. Um, and we got an entirely new generation of value at it. Um, I, I could, it's probably true that we actually use perspective dramatically more in its current implementation than we ever used it in its previous implementation. So um, if you are a technology manager or you are uh, looking at open sourcing your own technology or, or embracing open source development model um, for your own uh, internal projects, if you take one thing away from perspective, um, what I want you to take away is do not be scared of open source. Um, it is really a, for core technology, for honest technology and for powerful uh, technology in this industry, um, it's a really amazing tool um, to build things that are competitive. Uh, so what we're gonna be talking about today is uh, an order book. Um, sorry, an order book simulation. Uh, the distinction is very important. Um, perspective is effectively a database engine, kind of like a SQL database. Um, but unlike a SQL database, um, Perspective is designed to be used in the, in the front end. Um, it's designed to bring kind of the analytics and queryability of a data and performance of a database um, all the way down right up in front of the user just behind the pixels. So the user the business user, right? The non-technical user, somebody who doesn't really necessarily understand what a left outer join or an order by clause is, can still use those same kinds of data transforms to learn things about their data, read stuff about their data um, and play with their data. Um, because of WebAssembly, because of the uh, power and speed stability um, of the underlying engine that we had developed over years internally, um, it's very, very fast, it's very, very high performance scales extremely well horizontally with additional users uh, as they connect to one shared web server. But it is not designed to replace a traditional database. Specifically, while this talk is about building an order book simulation exclusively using perspective, do not build an order book using only perspective in your own applications. Um, to be clear, the code that I'm going to show you today is very, very similar, maybe in some cases nearly identical to the real code that we deploy using perspective, um, but it is for visualization servers, right? It is for users to be able to connect and look at things. Um, just like, for example, perspective is nowhere close to ACID compliant. Um, you should not do things like execute trades or, you know, uh, try to keep uh, transaction logs or things like that directly in perspective. Um, not because it won't perform, but because it was not built for that. And if you, you know, your building loses power or something like that, um, it's not going to be a fun time. Uh, the way that, you know, while this example is going to use perspective for everything to show you that it is easy to do and to show that the, that the API is designed to be really simple and symmetric, um, in a real application, um, you're going to want to actually do your data processing in a database that has durability, that can write to disk, that is going to be recoverable, um, and then use perspective to then fan that data out and stream it to as many browser clients as you want, and then let your, uh, your users then take that data and do whatever they want with it in the browser. Uh, so let's get started here. Um, okay, so what is perspective? I already said that it is a database. Um, and here's a little, I need to zoom out slightly. I hope everybody can still see this. Um, Perspective is database, and if you recall what a, uh, a general database is, it is a column or table, uh, a set of rows and columns that have the same, where every column is the same type, um, and a query. Um, you give a table a small declarative program in a language like SQL, um, and it gives you back a result set. Um, and perspective is similar. Um, we have tables, um, and we have a, an object called a view. Um, unlike a traditional database, um, Perspective does not have its own language like SQL. Um, instead, Perspective is embedded in another language. In this case, um, what I'm showing you now is Perspective embedded in Python, but Perspective is also embedded in JavaScript via WebAssembly. 
um, and they actually have uh, the exact same API. So it's really easy to take kind of any of the API calls and, and demonstration I'm going to show you today and transfer them between languages. Um, instead of a query, um, we have an object called view. And view is a lot like a query, um, but it's live. So when you uh, use the DSL that you've embedded perspective in to ask a table about the data, what you get back is an object um, that has the answer in it, but that answer will also update as the underlying table is updated. And this diagram uh, that I'm showing you right now is kind of a, uh, it's a made up architecture, just kind of showing you uh, a bird's eye picture of how perspective fits in in a Python and a JavaScript application. So over here, you can see that uh, this is a browser and this is an HTML page. And there's a couple of little perspective widgets on it. And you can see these little dotted lines that kind of point back to where those, the data is coming from. Um, in this top section, um, you can see a couple of little perspective um, widgets connected to various views running in a web worker. Um, and this is uh, the implementation pattern that you can see, for example, on the uh, perspective website. So if you click on any of these examples on the perspective website and uh, go, um, this application, for example, is running uh, a data set in a web worker and it's just generating fake data and the entire thing is running in your browser. Now, how we got data into it in this case was just making it up, but um, what's kind of implied in this diagram is that you as a developer have written some code to load data into the browser. It's already in the browser when you start and you're kind of using this pattern to run it. Um, in this very bottom row, you see something completely different. This line goes directly through the browser, out of the browser and all the way down into Python. Um, and if you've ever done any uh, you know, UI work in markets or, or finance or anything, you've probably seen a pattern like this before, uh, a virtual pattern where you have a very large data set, you want to visualize it in a browser, and uh, you don't want to serialize the entirety of the state. You don't want to ship all the data to the browser. Um, you basically just want to have whatever window on the screen is visible um, be fetched and have it do more fetching as the user wants to see more. So maybe pagination or virtual scroll or you know, queryability or you know, an aggregate data set or something like that. Um, and that's what this uh, uh, bottom diagram shows. Uh, I'm going to show you how to set that up and why that's relevant in a bit, but I just want to kind of give you an idea of what these things look like. Um, the key takeaway from this should be that these APIs are almost identical. And moving from this model to this model is like basically a matter of configuration rather than a matter of code. You can kind of choose, do I want to run the entire model on the server? Don't pull any data off the server and have a completely lightweight client? Or do I want to literally download the entire database runtime and the data into the browser and run it all in one place? Um, and then in this middle section, um, you actually see a hybrid model. Um, the interesting part is right here, what, we're, what you can literally do with perspective is you can use both. You can run the database in Python, load your data, um, populate it, pivot it, do queries on it. Um, and then when a browser connects, it has that exact same database code, that the exact same instance of perspective with the same C++ code that's running in Python. It downloads it to the browser um, and it stinks the entire table. So any changes that are made on the server, um, go through this little dotted yellow line, show up in the client, and you get this really cool, um, simple architecture where you can use the perspective API on the server to put data into the engine. And then in your browser application, you use the exact same API to pull data out of it and everything in between is handled for you. You get really, really good performance for downloading. Everything is serialized via Apache Arrow, um, which is a, actually I can show you because this is a nice little diagram that the Apache Arrow folks have on their website. It is an in-memory columnar data uh, format um, that is extremely fast to deserialize. Um, perspective does Delta updates on uh, using Apache Arrow to send them across a wire. And it is uh, an extremely fast way to load large amounts of data into the browser um, and keep it up to date as the underlying data changes. Um, so let's get to the, uh, the actual code part. So um, on the Perspective website, this guy, um, this is actually one of the examples that we're going to have up at some point. Um, it's not quite ready yet, um, 
but it will be. Um, and when it is ready, um, so this is the PR that it's going to actually be merged in. After the talk, if you're interested in following up or anything, or if I haven't gone through any of these things in enough uh, detail for you, um, you're welcome to log in to GitHub and take a look at the PR. Hopefully in the next couple of days, we'll have this stuff merged and then you will be able to find it in the examples directory along with all of these other interesting examples. Um, and there's some good instructions on the documentation page, which you can find also down here uh, on how to run the examples. Um, anyway, so back to the code. Um, so this is the project. Um, and I apologize uh, if this is a little uh, scattershot in its presentation. Um, I want to make sure that you know this isn't just a bunch of slides kind of obscuring uh, the actual, you know, what's actually going on. This is the real code that um, is going to be running. There's no smoke and mirrors or anything like that. Um, but I'm not going to go over completely everything that it does. I just want to kind of go over the high-level architecture points. Um, the uh, it involves two files, basically. One Python file, that's your server, um, and one JavaScript file, which is the front end. So let's start at the server and, and take a look at kind of what this architecture looks from the Python side. A um, bunch of imports and a market class. Um, if you recall my caveat earlier about uh, not taking my market simulation uh, seriously, just want to reiterate, um, I'm a programmer, not a quant. So um, this is a very naive market. Um, specifically, it is a video game. Um, we kind of built this as an idea of like, uh, we wanted to build something that was safe and that somebody could see the entire workflow without having it kind of obscured behind a, uh, you know, uh, somebody else's API or data fetching API or something like that. Um, specifically, if you're interested in a more like uh, a real illustration of what perspective can do vis-a-vis -vis data with real market data. Um, June Tan, who also works on perspective at JP Morgan, did an exceptional talk on perspective at JupyterCon last year. Uh, there's a video of it on the perspective website, which is one of these guys right here. Um, and it's kind of similar to this talk. Um, it doesn't go into the how the server part works as much, but it goes way, way more into depth into how the Jupyter part works and specifically how to integrate it with IEX, which is a live um, uh, real market that you can subscribe to and get real book and price history data. Um, but this simulation is making stuff up. If you're familiar with an order book, um, an order book is basically something that shows you uh, all of the open orders for a security or for a financial instrument. Um, and there are various ways you can visualize this, and I'm going to show you some of them in perspective. But before I do that, I want to, want to quickly show you what kind of data structure we're dealing with. Um, here's our market object. It's just a normal Python class. And in its little init method here, um, you can see that we're calling this little block of code, um, which, uh, if you're familiar with SQL, will look pretty familiar, right? Um, we're creating a table object, and we're passing it in this dictionary structure that has some names and some types. And obviously this is a schema, right? It's describing what the table should look like. And this is gonna be an orders table. Every row in it is gonna be a market order. Um, specifically, this market simulation is gonna be very simple. It is going, you're going to be able to enter a market order, um, either a buy or sell for a price um, and a number of shares, a, 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 a limit price and a number of shares. And the order will act like a market order and clear immediately up until there's no longer orders on the books to cover it. And then it will convert to a limit order for the rest of time with no expiration. Um, so you can see that the schema for this order table has values like symbol for which security it is, um, uh, price for the limit price, the order, um, the quantity uh, the, of shares that you wanna uh, make the order for and how many of them have already been filled. Um, which user it is that's created the order, whether it's a buy or a sell, um, whether it's been completely filled or not, um, and the time that it was created. Um, and this keyword argument ID, which basically just is a primary key, like exactly what you're familiar with with SQL. Um, there's some other tables in here that we use for uh, uh, doing some other visualization and debugging stuff in the front end that I'll show you in a second, but it's not super relevant. Um, and then the rest of this class is really simple. Uh, you can see that it's got some methods on it. 
that call things like update, um, cancel. Um, and they are calling methods on this table object. So in a, in a typical SQL database, um, you'll have a database of memory. It'll say something like update table something, something, something in a SQL DSL. Um, in perspective, you'll use the perspective language bindings. In this case, um, the methods that are on uh, your table object. In this case, I want to update the table with a array of rows. And this row, um, I'm going to set its order to whatever the uh, order ID was. And I'm going to set its filled value to its old filled value plus the quantity of uh, this fill. Um, these small methods on this class are literally just doing these very, very simple SQL operations to update the state of this one order table um, to reflect whatever operation I want to do. Create a new order, um, or in this case, partially fill an order because another market order came in and cleared some of the entries on it. Um, I don't want to go through all of these little things. They're not enti entirely interesting in and of themselves. And some of these are really kind of game bits. Instead, what I wanted to show was how easy it is to then take this kind of iterative development, this market simulation that is very, very simple and based on a SQL model, and then pull it into an entirely different context um, and start visualizing it immediately. So this is Jupyter Notebook. Um, and I'm going to import perspective and a couple little other things. Um, and server, which is the file we're just looking at. I'm going to set the logging level um, so you don't see a bunch of order spam. Um, I'm going to create some objects and some threads, which I will describe in a little bit. Um, and then I'm going to create a perspective widget. Um, and I'm going to pass it the order table that we were just looking at, literally this object. When I do so, you can see that I get a table. Um, this is perspective uh, hooked up to that market running within this Jupyter widget. Um, so it doesn't look very impressive right now. Um, it doesn't even look like it's moving, um, but it is. And you can tell by taking the time column and dragging it over here to sort descending. And now you can see that um, kind of like a uh, trade blotter. I'm sorry, I'm scrolling all over the place here. Kind of like a trade blotter, you can see new orders coming in at the top. Now, um, there are uh, some AI, AI players running in the background that are kind of making random orders. And as you can see, they're not particularly smart. <laughs> but they are running. Um, but this isn't an order book, right? This is just a raw dump of the orders as they are coming in. Um, well, what is an order book? Well, you really want to see the depth. Um, let's start by actually segregating these out, right? You can see that like some of these are closed immediately because they're filled as soon as they put in and some of them are still open and I really only want to see the open ones. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, by filtering down to only the open orders, um, you now see only the orders that um, have unfilled uh, uh, shares left in them. Um, obviously, we don't want to see all the orders have already closed out in our book. Um, we want to discriminate. You can see that these are mixed buy and sell orders. Um, we want to discriminate on these. So let's split by side. And now we have a column for all of our buy orders over here and a column for all of our sell orders over here. Um, that's pretty close to what we want. Um, we don't need to see the uh, ID, I don't think, and player is probably not relevant, um, but uh, these are still in time order. And what we really want to see is price order, right? We want to see all of the bids um, and then all of the asks kind of arranged in price order so we know where the spread is. It's really easy to do in perspective by simply grouping by price. And now you can see Price in order on the, oh, sorry, I'm still sorting by time, so I'll remove that. There we go. And price is actually upside down because conventionally we won't see the other direction. There we go. Uh, so, okay, so now you can see all of these rows grouped by price. Highest price at the top, lowest price at the bottom. Um, and, oops, sorry, still scrolling all over the place. Why don't I pop this out? Um, create new view for output. There we go. Okay. OK, so now this is starting to look a little more like an order book, right? Um, you can see the buys over here, the sells over here, um, and all your prices range lowest to highest on the left. Uh, but we're not quite there yet. Um, you'll notice there is a lot of crossover here. 
And these numbers are not making sense. Um, the numbers are defined by these aggregates. When you group values in perspective, um, each one of these rows now represents more than one row in the underlying data set. So we need to be able to uh, change these to something like, um, let's say, uh, no, that's right. Uh, let's take this, this, and this. And we'll make, we'll leave time in there so we can see when the last update time is, but we'll make it the last aggregate. So what I've done is I've taken this column and I've said, instead of telling me how many unique times are in this column, I wanna see the last time that this column was updated. Um, and then the last thing that really doesn't make this an order book is this weird crossover here. And the reason it's there is because this is every order for every security in one giant book. We really only wanna see one at a time. So let's take this symbol function, drag it over to filter and just look at Apple. And suddenly we have something that actually looks very much like an order book. Um, well, it would if my mark simulation was better. Um, in a data grid, you can't really see how poorly these uh, AIs are actually trading. But if I were to change this over to a bar chart, um, you can now see the um, buys on the bottom, the sells on the top. Um, and you can see that if these were real traders, we would, they would be wiped out. <laughs> because they're not actually making good decisions. Uh, so, uh, the, the, you know, again, this is a simulation, but the point is, is just to kind of show you that it is very, very easy to go directly from data to kind of a working uh, visualization of kind of traditional financial uh, 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 charts, graphs, um, and kind of visualizations of financial data very quickly with perspective interactively. But it's also easy to do it programmatically. So take it for example, um, this widget that you just saw me configure Every widget in perspective in Python and JavaScript has a method called save. And if I call it, whoops, that's not four, it's seven. There we go. If I call it, I get a dictionary. Um, if you'll notice, the dictionary that is returned actually reflects exactly what I have set up in the setting. And every perspective um, can be reinflated from that dictionary exactly in the state that you left it. So let me give you an example. Um, over here, I have running. I'm just going to start up this server. So the exact same code that I was just showing you in Jupyter, I'm now running as a standalone Python file um, here. And what it has done is it has started uh, a couple of threads, the same threads that you saw me start in Jupyter, these two. Um, and what it's basically done is it's, uh, the AI thread is just so I have a bunch of AI players kind of trading in the background, but the perspective thread is actually quite interesting. One of the neat things that we can do with perspective is uh, in traditional Python, because it's a single threaded language, um, especially in finance where you potentially have operations on the server that are very time consuming or take a long time to calculate, um, it can be uh, uh, an engineering uh, challenge to get good performance, right? Because the user connects, they make some long running query and the entire server is frozen for the entire time that the query is executed. Um, because perspective is written entirely in C++ and because once the data is put into a table and it is protected entirely behind the Python interface, perspective can actually release what's called the global interpreter lock, which allows perspective to run entirely in parallel of the background. So unlike a traditional uh, Python application, um, when you give a query to perspective, it takes it off onto another thread and runs it in parallel with whatever else your server is doing. This is one of the secrets to perspective being able to attain uh, exceptional performance in Python in terms of uh, scalability. In queries that come in don't necessarily have to conflate with each other or stack up or block the performance of other users that are connecting, which happens by default in a normal Python application. Um, and this application, you know, is literally just doing the exact same thing that I did in the Jupyter application, right? It's starting these threads um, and it's using an internal uh, tool that is part of the perspective toolkit called Perspective Manager, which is literally just a little tiny class that allows you to plug some perspective tables into a tornado server and expose it to the internet. Um, and once you've done so in JavaScript, connecting back to that server is incredibly easy. You create a WebSocket object and you pass it the URL of the server you created and suddenly every table that you've instantiated with Python is now available to open in perspective. You can open it virtually as in, uh, 
as in this model, um, where you are opening the object, but the object is a proxy and you're not loading the data. Um, you can also load it in this model, where you're loading it and actually duplicating the whole engine down into the browser and syncing it live as the, as the server updates. Um, in this case, we're going to do the latter. We're going to take a view of this server table and create a web worker clone of it. So this line basically takes that orders table that we we're just looking at at Jupyter, creates a browser version of it, and connects it in lock sync. So they will all, any updates that happen on the server are happening on the client. Um, it then uh, uh, does some other simple setup. And there's a little bit down here that you don't need to worry about that is simply setting up this side bit. OK, cool. So this little part over here on the left was the rest of the code that I didn't talk about. And it's a little control panel um, that allows you to kind of click on things and enter your uh, prices and what you want to uh, order. The reason I'm not going through it is because this has nothing to do with perspective. It doesn't even have to do with any real framework. Um, this stuff is just pure regular HTML. This is an input. This is an HTML button. And I'm just using plain JavaScript to hook these things up. But if you're interested in how this works, uh, it's available on the uh, GUI. Um, and then uh, just the la one last thing. You can see that you know, pulling this data in, I get this exact same view that you were just looking at in JupyterLab, uh, this flat kind of nonsense uh, market view that doesn't really reflect what we wanted to see. But if you remember, when I called the save method, I got back a data structure. Um, that data structure looks kind of like this data structure. In fact, this JSON file, I got by playing around with the UI until it looks the way I wanted, and then calling save and copying that token and just pasting it in this file. And because I did that, I can now add this line to literally restore the JSON that I had previously saved, which transforms perspective from this flat, uninteresting view to this interesting market view that shows me my order book, my uh, order uh, volume graph, and this cool little price history and uh, transaction log. And then if I think, if I actually select one of these, so you can see that like uh, when I select JPMC out of this ticker list, all I'm doing here is adding JPMC as a filter to all of these views, but it has the effect of cross filtering all of these down to what I'm interested in. Um, if I were to select, say, Tesla, which doesn't seem to be doing good in this situation, uh, you can see at the top here that there are 536 orders outstanding, or 536 shares outstanding. Uh, let's see if I can actually wipe out this book. I want to buy 536 shares. The highest price is 106, so let's offer uh, 150. Um, and sorry, I'm not a good trader. <laughs> and let's see if I can wipe them out. I can. And as you can see, I completely wiped out the sell side on the book and the uh, market price for Tesla went through the roof. Um, so yeah, uh, that's a very condensed overview of kind of the high level uh, view of perspective. I know I glossed over some things, but I want to emphasize specifically that um, we're not talking about a lot of code here. The entirety of the front end is less than 150 lines. Um, plus this one JSON file that I literally copy and pasted out of Jupyter. Um, and the entirety of the server is 500 lines. Um, but the vast majority of this is these kind of canned queries, SQL-like queries that come that are uh, direct corollaries to the, uh, the, the settings that you can put in these viewers. Um, I think that's all the time I have. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this very quick overview of how the perspective uh, environment works and how we use it. Um, I'm kind of what a, again, simulation order book looks like. And I guess it's time for questions. I think, um, I think we should probably just uh, plan on doing a longer form <laughs> uh, version bad. of this at some point, uh, um, but also, uh, for those of you interested, we will be recording a podcast with Andrew and we'll go a little bit deeper into perspective and a little bit deeper into this too. But I, I but uh, watching this and seeing 
how many attendees were staying on, plus getting some comments from our internal team. Um, I feel like uh, we may need to do this again in, in a much longer time period. So um, thank you, Andrew. Um, and just real quickly, um, uh, we do have some questions, but I think we're going to have to answer them offline, possibly. Um, I did want to say that we do try to make uh, uh, these meetups uh, more like uh, in-person meetups. And sorry, there's no pizza today, but uh, we do have uh, t-shirts from a random drawing uh, for Justin S. from 66 East and Julia W. from RVC. Um, Justin and Julia will be sending an email out to you to get your information and size for the t-shirts. Um, again, I'm sorry, we, we will, um, Andrew, I will, um, we'll stay on after this and I'll uh, give you the questions uh, that we did have and then we can pass those on to the attendees who asked if that's cool. Uh, uh, sure. Okay, awesome. Um, but I want to thank all of you for attending today's open source and fintech meetup. Uh, in April, we have an open source readiness panel on the 7th, so next Wednesday, on running an open source project from inside a bank. Uh, plus, we will have all of our or we will have our all community call on the 28th. If you're already on the mailing list, we have information on our next US, UK, and APEC meetups uh, that will be out soon. Um, also, please look out and subscribe to our open source and fintech podcast, our bi-weekly newsletter, our weekly This Week at Finos email, and follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn and join the Finos Slack channels that James put in the chat earlier. Uh, if you have any questions about events, contact us at events at finos.org. If you have any questions about the Finos community or getting involved, info at finos.org. You can speak directly to our director of community, James McLeod, who is right now starting office hours um, and I can put that link in the chat if you're interested in uh, talking to him um, or reach out to any of our FinOS team members. Um, and, and Andrew, we'll go ahead and what we'll do is for the video that we're producing, we'll go ahead and answer the question uh, that we did have. Uh, but I want to go ahead and say uh, thank you, good day, good night, wherever thank you are. Thank you all are. so much for hosting us. It's, we really appreciate it. Yeah, we well, did a great job. Again, we're, we're getting good comments from everywhere. Um, and um, so so let's go ahead, uh, kind of uh, anybody who wishes to stay on, please go ahead. Um, uh, but let's go ahead and answer some of the questions that we uh, did have. And if that's cool. Yep. Okay. So I saw um, that about custom aggregate functions. Right, um, Ryan, Ryan asks, is there a way to do user defined aggregate functions? So the answer is, in current perspective, no. Um, we have this uh, button called the new column button, which supports things like uh, a good example of using the new column button effectively would be, for example, taking this um, market chart that I have right here and saying, uh, instead of showing me all the times, maybe I want to say the minute bucket of all the times, right? And I would say minute bucket time. Um, it creates a new column, right, which then I can uh, put on the y-axis instead of time. And now I get a much lower granularity version of that same chart. Um, this is not a custom aggregate, but a lot of the things that you could do with an aggregate, um, you can break up into the aggregates we currently have and a new column step that does kind of the map operation to the aggregates uh, reduce operation. Um, in the next version of perspective that is coming out, we are releasing uh, this new feature, uh, which is a rewrite of that engine using a very powerful embedded DSL called ExpertTK. Um, and ExpertTK allows all sorts of cool uh, stuff. My, fingers crossed, my dream is to do the next, uh, next time we are hopefully invited to do a Fenos talk on perspective. I really wanna show up how to do a ray tracing uh, engine uh, built entirely in uh, perspective and expressions within this API. Anyway. Um, once this feature lands, um, it's going to allow you to still do the same thing as I just showed you with new columns, but massively more complicated expressions. And in a future version, we intend on using this DSL to apply to not just um, new columns and filters, but also to aggregates and sorts and all sorts of other features. So the idea is to kind of take this DSL and make it so that Anywhere where there's a column name or anywhere we want to use a column, you can turn it into an expression. That includes split-like criteria, uh, uh, 
uh, group by criteria, aggregate functions, filters, sorts, et cetera. Well, Lisa, thank you. Uh, this would be very useful for debugging. Um, so, uh, do you mind if I add? Well, go ahead. What do you mean by list? <laughs> uh, yes, actually. So, uh, yes, the DSL does help uh, with composing filters. Not just does it help. So, obviously, you can use the DSL to do things like take any column and turn it into an arbitrary Boolean value that you can use as a filter. Um, but you can also use. Uh, what was the feature? Um, it can also do stuff like this, which is use filters instead of reducing the data set. You can then use the expression to basically split the data set into the things that apply to the filter and the things that don't apply to the filter. Um, there is an operation built into perspective that might not work. Um, Uh, we might only have it turned on for strings. Let me see here. Now we don't have enabled. Um, the internal engine uh, has an operation called join that's list basically. So uh, if you are interested, actually, that would be an awesome, um, I don't mean to impose, but if you were interested in uh, contributing to perspective, that would be an awesome project. Um, it's an operation that's already implemented in the engine because it was implemented for our desktop engine. But we haven't exposed it in the JavaScript yet, and it would be fairly straightforward to, to expose it as a JavaScript function to be available on the UI. Um, if you'd like, you're, we'd love a contribution. Um, and you're also welcome to just fill out an issue. Um, we take our issues and feature requests and stuff on perspective very seriously. Um, we, anything that we leave open, we are going to address at some point. We do have jobs, so <laughs> please be patient with some of the implementations of these things. Um, but you know, if you if it's something you're really interested in, you'd like us to track it, um, just open up a brief uh, feature request issue on the Perspective GitHub page, and we'll comment on it. Oh, sorry. Actually, another thing you can do is uh, yeah. So you can't actually do joins except, uh, explicitly, but you can do multi-level pivots. So for example, like here, I'm pivoting by name, um, and I'm showing client, right? I mean, you can see that there are three clients under each one of these names. But if I were to make client the next level pivot, you can actually see all of the clients that are underneath each of those. Um, it's not quite visually what you were asking for, um, but uh, it does show you that information. Well, it looks like uh, Ryan has said he's interested in helping. So that, so all of this is worth it, all of it. <laughs> that is awesome. We love free um, code. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, does anybody else have any questions? Awesome. Uh, uh, Andrew, there are some compliments in the chat, um, again, uh, from the attendees, but like I said, we're getting them from your team. Thank you. So, uh, yeah. Um, so I think with that, uh, uh, again, we're going to be recording the podcast. We'll try to take some, uh, or those questions into account here. And um, if you have any other questions, please put them in chat. But uh, otherwise, we will see you folks. Uh, again, we have an open source readiness uh, meeting next week with, um, with the guest speakers there. We'll have an all call on the 28th. And we'll be doing another one of these meetups for the US, um, I believe, in May. But we may have um, a UK one. Uh, between there. So, uh, Andrew, again, thank you so much for um, for uh, speaking today, and um, uh, hope everybody has a great day and great evening. Thank you. I had a blast. Thank you.